I'm going, uh, okay, let me first get to the beginning. Is um, this Lou kind of made a reference to uh, evolution because that is like the fashion, but I think there is also human development, lifespan development, and uh, that that can uh, give a, a, a much more interesting uh, explanation about the dynamics uh, between uh, right and wrong. Now, uh, are you uh, sorry? I I don't know whether uh, I clicked on the the right screen share. Um, that should be this one. Yeah, and then I need to find. the slideshow thing. So I'm, okay, my, all these Zoom boxes are getting a little bit in the way. So I, I'm uh, continuing uh, with what I did last time. Uh, this, I, I decided to focus, start everything uh, with the, the uh, Ashby, uh, Ashby's work and the work of Glanville, this on, uh, the black box um now okay let me start yeah so let me so uh ross ashby's black box as a tool to develop and maintain a common ground so i i use different colors to like emphasize where i want to go and so everything as glanville says everything starts with a distinction and a distinction uh this here, eh, I just drew a distinction uh, that can be treated as an unopened, opaque box. So does the distinction in our mind is a box and we don't know what's inside it. And uh, we can like immediately open it or we can keep it closed forever. Uh, but the, the three, we're cyberneticians, and so I listened to Paul's uh, three or four uh, clips explaining cybernetics, uh, cybernetics, so in which direction is one steering the ship, eh? that is the way he described, trial and error, eh? and he was very visual in the way he did it, but, but when I read it in that way, it's not really, uh, it's, it didn't feel right to me, it's more like in which direction would I like to discern the ship being steered, so so here I acknowledge that I'm not alone on the ship. It's not just me. There are other people and, and there are all sorts of other things. And, and it's all a trial and error process. And so, um, and what I'm actually doing now, I'm, I'm playing a game with a metaphor and it's radar technology. And it's the technology on which uh, uh, Norbert Riener was working. Uh, but I also think of the writing and the drawing of distinctions as a radar technology for my mind. So I'm sending something in the world. Eh? I, I write something, it's outside me, and then it's coming back to me with information to either adjust my way of thinking or, or keep where I am. So this getting back, eh, there is the back box, black box. I can keep it closed or I can decide to open it. But there is another operation discussed uh, in logic and that is I can actually give a name to the box before I open it and that name is actually then telling in which direction that I that I want to steer the ship or that I would like to see it steered and so this today um, and so here the act of naming uh, that is a logical, that is extensively discussed in the discipline of logic. And so I need to make a decision now. I mean, because I can, I, I really can decide, uh, trial and error, how I name the box. So, but here I decided to set it up as a tool. This, I have uh, boxes here with me. And so this is not just some imagined tool. It's very practical and concrete. Just to develop the common ground with with Lou, Jason, Jerry, and anyone else here, Larry. And so in my case, uh, when I'm opening it, I'm going to find Aristotle's triangles of reference. And now uh, why that particular tool? Uh, because they have been very helpful to me. 
And so I look at that triangle, you can say three corners, three sides, but I also see six black boxes. Now, why are I so into the triangle and someone could say that I'm obsessed by it? Well, that is because I was a foreigner. I was an immigrant. I was a stranger to cybernetics and the club of Remy. And you all welcomed me, but the welcoming was not enough. And also, by the way, to George Spencer Brown's uh, laws of form, I was a complete stranger. So you all welcomed me. There was a, a, a great amount of hospitality, but that wasn't enough. I, I needed something else to help me understand what all of you were doing. And that happened to be literally the triangle of reference, just that I literally was drawing it and trying to understand uh, what was happening. But then when I talked with other people, I, I realized I was talking to a wall, <laughs> like nothing came back. So then I realized, okay, this is a way of using it that I'm doing that's very different from the, from the literature, so to say that many people are familiar with. And so that literature is particularly uh, those triangles of reference of Ogden and Richard, but also the triads of pairs. And so Aristotle is like 100% different from pairs. So it's very important, and I'm just repeating it again, to think of it as something different and to just erase or, or, or put in the back burner everything you know about these triangles. And so here we go. As I see the triangles, they highlight the minimal set of necessary distinctions to make the civilizing process move forward successfully. So uh, I'm saying very clearly it's minimal, so there's much more needed. But if you ignore any of these distinctions, you're guaranteed uh, miscommunications, misperceptions, all sorts of misunderstandings. So I look at it as a heuristic. And so uh, there is also a little punchline, uh, but I, I, I'm just putting it out there because it might be helpful that I'm not just uh, randomly walking. There is in logic something that's called the third logical law of identity. And it was actually invented in the 19th century. Uh, I mean, it was like in the making since Leibniz, but like apparently William Jevons was the one who said it's a law and it's a third law. And then a whole mythology developed around it to say, yeah, we found the missing law, the law that Aristotle didn't articulate, but was already there. And so now everywhere this law is being uh, written about as like something really important. But actually, I would go the opposite direction and say it's 100% useless. And that is the reason we have a clash of civilization, because that law has excuse somehow me, corrupted excuse the Excuse me for one moment. Could I hmm? ask you a question? I'd like to ask you a question. Yes, I, go uh, ahead. It's really in the form of a request. So far, you have told us about Aristotle's triangles, but you haven't yeah. given us an example. And that now is you've the told entire... us about a third logical law, and you haven't given us an example. Well, yeah, I will we don't know. Third we logical don't law yeah, can I, Lou, Lou, can I uh, give Go on. now? That's all. Um, um, what I did is the steering of the ship. I say where I could also create this as a as a hide and see game or a detective novel, in which I uh, no, I mean not that like a suspense, and you don't know what's going to happen. No, I'm just saying this is the direction that I'm going. So here is uh, the triangle of reference. And I say I'm going to now name it so that you can see what I mean by the triangle. So the triangle kind of say there is always a human being. And I'm just using myself to keep it simple. And when human beings communicate... They, they all, I mean, that's the reason we have a language is because we're communicating about something. And I use the example of a chicken. Now, if I'm creating the intention to communicate, I imagine a chicken. And that is science too that uh, Jason was talking about. But for me to communicate about the chicken, I need a linguistic sign a language. And so what I here did is there is no relation of identity involved here. These are all relations of difference. And I don't think there is anyone like 
unless they have maybe a degree in quantum mechanics that is going to say there is a hidden relation of identity here. I think that's actually the mistake in science that they're hunting down and say, now I need to find a way to express a relation of identity between these three differences. So, um, so now I'm, I'm entering the domain of formal logic. So instead of using the written word and language, I just use the symbol L. And now I can, uh, this, I'm beginning to introduce abstract thinking. So I, I introduce three symbols with three relations and I give you a formalism or something abstract, but it's purely distinctions. So there is no order, there is no numbering, it's all distinctions that are organized in a, with the aid of a structure that we geometrically understand. So now what I did is I did substitutions uh, that I allowed myself to do, but I could also have said that I'm not allowed. But in this case, I allowed. Uh, and so again, I'm saying I'm not using any law of identity here. I, I'm using rules of substitutions dictated by the language game. And so now I'm going to label the sides. So uh, again, I can treat them as black boxes, but I can give them a name. So the first one is the sensory modalities about which uh, you were talking earlier. Uh, we have a tendency to emphasize vision, but there are at least four other modalities that play a role. But now here is that other modality, and that is the one I think that cybernetics is really engaged in. And what is important, I think, and, and the triangle really helps us see there's a different modality that has nothing to do with the sensory modality. But we also need that third box, and that third box is about how we get introduced to linguistic symbols, how we work with language, but also how we get introduced to logic. And I call that a civilizing process uh, because this is a massive organizational um, phenomena because you need schools, you need teachers, you need parents that want to make sure that their children learn how to read and write. And you need also someone that keeps an eye on the language that it actually uh, that there are dictionaries so that people understand how to use the lexicons, that it doesn't just uh, deteriorate in, in, in 8 billion different languages. So uh, so this here I'm just emphasizing what I said earlier. So we have actually two very, very different ways. I'm not saying one is better than the other. They're 100% different of looking at the biological, physiological, neurological processes. So one way is the sensory modality. I think that's what Jason called science one. And so that a, a, there is a causality and we don't know how to call it. So we have a lexicon. Some people call it event causality. Then is it mechanical? Is it biochemical? We're still talking about it. Is it quantum mechanical? But then there is this other uh, way of looking. And that is really talking, uh, working with the creative and the discursive modalities. And uh, and just the educational processes are also part of it. So we've two ways. Uh, one way, the just on the left, that is science two of Jason, I think, the individual observer. And what you see at the bottom is all the individual observers uh, or not all of them, some of them working together and say it's important we have educational institutions. And so this is a, a different causality from the one on the right. It needs its own lexicons, dictionaries. Some call it action causality. Is it working with the emotions, something to be explored? And is this cybernetics? That's not up to me, I mean, to decide that, but it sounds very much like cybernetics to me. So now... Uh, what I want to point out is what I see happening as a problem is that the difference between these two uh, processes are being trivialized. So that either people say it's all sensory, I don't really need to know anything about that other modality, I'm going to explain the universe by just focusing on the sensory processes, or other people say 
ah, they're one and the same. We can just talk about them as if there is no difference. And then, of course, you have the third group who are trying to say there is a difference and we really need to pay attention to it. And I think that Deleuze is one of those people who, who wants to get us to think about the logic of difference. And so this, so now I'm repeating again where I said I was going. This, why do we not see that difference? Now, some people say, well, it's a random process. It's evolution. It's a revolutionary path that prevented us from seeing the difference. And I'm saying, no, it may be cultural, but we need to talk with the historians of logic because they're doing this work right now. And this, in the 19th century, there was a fascination with the thinking of the universe as a machine. And at that moment, people started mixing up engineering logic with Aristotle's original triangles and his own logic. And in that mix up, this William Jevons got his idea of the third law of logic. And then somehow that law got traction. And and then we have uh, like 150 years of of people who went along, people who said no, I'm not doing it, and but so we have all these different conversations in the discipline of logic that are going on, and so what I'm saying is, and and I, it's not that I happily say this, but since it, uh, I, I'm motivated here by Jason because he recognizes also. There is a problem here, but now what is the name that we are going to give this problem? And I think it is that there is this law of identity that makes certain logicians like do an operation as a substitution operation. But, but because they call it identity, they invoke the idea of the relation of identity. Well, it, there is never a relation of, of identity. But the fact that the logicians do that, that seeps into the introductory courses in logic and from there seeps into the entirety of the university. And so everyone in the university is kind of searching for a relation of identity while it, it, it's totally an absurd project, so to say. And so why do people have an identity crisis? Because they're searching for something they were never supposed to search for because it didn't exist. And, and so... If I need to blame someone, I would say the logicians need to sort out what's going on in their discipline and, and be more careful. That, and, and actually, let's apply some insight from Uncle Wittgenstein. This, the logicians are playing, are very good at playing very discipline specific language games, but it's the language game in which the rule is uh, the rule is part of the game. And it's a rule that say there is a law of identity and you need to operate it. But they could do the same thing with saying it's a rule that uh, dictates substitution. And now uh, I wanted to point out, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so here, very important, that last sentence, one is playing a language game with someone else, an other. And that is... Uh, the reason I brought up Wittgenstein, but also that I want to say how how uh, disruptive and misleading that third law of identity is, because there is something missing in that triangle that I showed earlier, and I'm bringing it out here now by combining six triangles. And I want to also point out here, I number them, but the numbering doesn't mean an ordering. The numbering is me being creative and having to decide I need to point out the difference and how I'm going to do it. I can say A, B, C, D, F, but I can also say one through six. So there are six triangles. So, uh, and also um, to, to kind of introduce you to the exercise properly, I'm not using the descriptive language. This is extremely important. I'm using the injunctive language and I want you to switch gestalts. So I'm doing ceci n'est pas un pip, eh, that you look at something, you make an association, but you actually, there are many more associations you can make. And I think, uh, this, that, that's not just visual that we do this, but we do that also in many other ways. So I'm I'm really 
uh, now here engaging with the injunctive function of language, I ask you to be patient and to walk me th through the exercise and, uh, uh, and, and focus on the switching of the gestalt. And also this is a reminder that Wittgenstein say some things you cannot describe, but you can show them. And that people made, uh, I think Ramsey was made fun of Wittgenstein, but Wittgenstein is totally correct. Like sometimes you, yeah, you need to do something different. And that is what one could call the pretend function of language. So here what I'm now doing is highlighting that Aristotle was actually working with six triangles and that the fact that that has not been emphasized has resulted in us not ignoring something that's crucially important in science one and science two. And that is that there is always an other human being who's listening. And, and I just needed to pick someone and I, I found this beautiful picture online. So I decided to go with that. So when we use language or logical symbols or mathematical symbols, it's always for someone that we think will be listening, and it can also be our inner voice. But but usually when we use language, when we have a language, that is because there are others involved. And then, uh, as I pointed out, there is the talking. Listening is very different from talking. It's much more... Um, I mean, it's much more energy intensive, so to say, but there's also writing, which is radically different from talking. And now we have reading. And the way I set it now up is as how uh, um, someone who doesn't know how to read and write, how do they learn it? Someone has a ruler and, and, and people point to a word and they speak the word. Uh, just while they're writing it. So they speak while they write, uh, they speak while they read, and, and they hear themselves saying it. But then as we get more used to it, uh, just that are my, uh, just the, the last two, uh, the triangles that we are using. I mean, we're not speaking aloud anymore when we read and write. So now what is the purpose of me pointing this out is that I gave you schemas of distinctions. And when I see these distinctions, I can engage in the risk benefit decision making. I can say, what is the cost of ignoring and trivializing the distinction? And that was what Frege was doing. He said, well, you will get a lot of misunderstandings and it's not going to end well. But what happened in 1913 Otto Neurath came along and said, let's start with a clean slate. Let's imagine that the decision-making of a scientist is gambling. And he was like applying evolutionary biology because he said, well, if the genes, if that is all a random process, so it's all a random process, which decision that I make, why don't we just take that as our null model? But just the tragedy of it is that at that time, there was already a lot of risk-benefit models, but for some reason, uh, Otto Norat got away with his gambling. And so, this is, this is my closing slide. This, this triangle is not just some random triangle. It's actually, one can put names on the boxes, but they're closed boxes still. So it's not that I put a name on it, therefore I understand it perfectly. No, it is a journey of figuring out. So what is so special about the creative processes uh, or the uh, creative modalities versus the sensory modalities. And so for me to do that, I have to switch the whole time. And this, here we see a switching between creative switching between two different metaphors, this distinctions as cuts, that is Plato's butcher who cuts nature as his joint. But what I also show here is distinctions as containers, and that is Aristotle's categorical logic. And now how did I develop this argument? Actually by reading George Spencer Brown's Laws of Form and really focusing on the first chapter and the introduction. So thank you. Uh, this, uh, a special uh, thank you to Lou, but I also should mention uh, Jerry because he also helped me uh, uh, see 
this the the, the difference between uh, he he also helped me see distinctions that were crucially important. Thank you. Sorry. I'd like to just affirm the the discussion you're making about identity. I think that uh, understanding what we mean or don't mean by identity is really crucial in in understanding how we reason and how we think and how we take points of view on things. People often make wrong identifications or or substitutions that are not necessary. Uh, thank you, Lou. Um, yeah, I've been listening to you. Let me, <laughs> our, uh, our earlier conversations. And Gerard, um, I'm glad to see you because I had hoped you would be there with my last presentation because I made, I was winking to your work there. <laughs> I've been studying it, especially uh, your writings on problem solving. Well, your use of uh, concept of black box is a little bit different from mine. Uh, in my mind, uh, a black box is used uh, to be black all the time. Uh, in other words, it, it is used to, to shift our attention from what's inside into uh, what it will give out if we give feed it input like this, what kind of output uh, is that uh, it will produce. So from uh, uh, without opening the black box, we look at the output, we look at the input, we can build up a function between the two uh, so that we can uh, leave the black box unopened. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Ronald said that inside every black box there is another one. Uh, that's how that's how the quantum physicists uh, keep opening black boxes and ending up in the last one that they have they have no way to deal with it except uh, some philosophy. Uh, philosophy fact philosophy signs in it as, as a strings. So, so, so that's one comment. Uh, I would like to see your more uh, uh, clarification of the whole Ashby uh, used that uh, to support your argument. Uh, the second thing is uh, about the whole triangle uh, and your proposal of eliminating uh, one of the logic laws. Assume you are right. What kind of a revolution are you going to generate? Okay. In the field uh, of logic. <laughs> okay. Let me first, Jason, I think you answered the question yourself. So um, that this, when I open the black box, I find another black box. And so I always will find another black box. But when when I make that statement, I, I'm I'm making a a, a a God's a God's eye statement. So the only thing I can say is, I don't know. Let me open the box and and see where it leads me. And then I find another box. And now, uh, but 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 the way I use it is, I open it and I find like the triangle. I find six boxes. So, but then actually, when I look closer, there there are actually more than six. So then I have to decide which one are I going to open. So I open one of them, and then the other ones are taken for granted assumptions. But then I hope one of my colleagues opens another one and that he tells me what he finds in his box and now we share notes. Uh, and so the triangle helps me from moving from one discipline uh, and communicating with someone in a different discipline without any need for transdiscipline and meta, meta, meta discipline. I, I just need to like say, okay, what what is it that you're talking about? And then, and then very important is... Are there paradoxes, inconsistencies between our ways of talking? And so what do these inconsistencies signify? So to 
really pay attention whenever there is something that doesn't make sense to kind of say now why are we not why are we suddenly on a different wavelength and um and now um so this when uh the the figure in glanville's paper is the the scientist as an input output black box and but that is again what you said eh? as the scientist keeps on working and working i mean the black box get opened in some way so we we understand much better the human mind than we did uh we six also. years ago now in terms of the revolution uh it's is the sort of thing the revolution won't be televised it, it will be happening in all the k-12 classrooms where there are teachers who are working with the the children uh showing them uh how you can uh do things um uh, this with a box so to say how it is a helpful tool uh and 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 if there is an evolution to be had i would say it is to make a sharp line between the drawing of distinctions and mathematics and now what does the activity drawing of distinctions what name should it be given i like to give it the name of logic but but that itself can be a, a big mess because there are many different ways in which the 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 word logic is being used today but an important distinction is the difference between engineering logic and human communication logic and i think that is recognize the distinction but the names the names are all over the place so so there needs to be discipline in in the naming and i think the black I box hope. the black box uh, or the opaque unopened box can oh. help one sort out well my my understanding I, I a... is that, that uh, uh, if we if we have to use a black box we're not supposed to open it if it can be opened it's not a black box at all uh, you know in airlines industry they only open the black box when there is a huge accident when the plane crash <laughs> then, then they have to open it otherwise we would just leave it as black that's a particular kind of black box yeah well, uh, I, I have a question about the relationship between this use of the black box, Margareta, and another part of your point of view, which you, you didn't quite mention here, which is the importance of the unobservable. Can you speak to that? Um, yes, and I think the black box for me personally is and that is the distinction of George Spencer Brown um is signifies how in our mind we make a distinction between um it's not in our mind but it's let's say more it's a theoretical distinction on paper uh, so that and it played a huge role in the Vienna circle uh just to make a distinction between the observable and the unobservable but before the Vienna Circle, it played a role in behaviorism, uh, just that they were going to focus on the observable behavior and just ignore just the unobservable, so to say. And that they kind of said that will take care of itself. And that is where Popper comes in. That Popper kind of came up with this demarcation line. So he had his own terminology, but, but he said the unobservable needs to be part of the conversation. Uh, we cannot just ignore it. And then and, it becomes a black box. And it is the black box. So the black box helps to bring in the unobservable without having to break our head of, oh, over it. Um, but it's inside the box, so we don't see it. It's a box we open and it's literally empty because it's full of photons and photons interact with our eyes. We never see them. We, we need all sorts of tricks to make them observable. And there is a literature that says we use figurative language to reify the unobservable and make it discussable however the the angle is that it's figurative so it's never a perfect um 
uh, capturing, there, there's always something that eludes us or that is missing. And that is the reason that people say sometimes you need to work with three metaphors, because if you only work with one, then you may get tunnel vision and you focus on the similarities and you totally forget the difference. And that, Jason, is something I learned from the management discipline, because there, any company with tunnel vision goes bankrupt. So one is acutely aware of the dangers of tunnel vision. Mm, okay. More questions? Or do you want to hear my presentation? Yes. Uh... I don't, Jason. Hi, it's Lisa. Hey. Um, hi, Lisa. Go ahead. I just, Jimmy, I want to um, mention um, your presentation speaks to me very strongly because um, I my background includes um, 25 years in brick and mortar schools as um, a special language acquisition expert, especially working with um, kindergarten through 12th grade English as a new language learners. So I was constantly in many transdisciplinary, I made it transdisciplinary situations of science, schooling, language and culture, but um, especially important, I used to explain to the children because they were being tested for language proficiency in order to sit for the state exams. So I was part of that process development. And no matter how young the child was or the family or the teachers I worked with, I explained those mapping of listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and that it was all in a field of content in school. Now, academic language adds a whole other set of hurdles, um, but I really appreciate for the black box metaphor that you're inviting us to, because I would say that just the simple naming it of a black box invites a mystery. We can say there are different types of black boxes and what they're used for, Jason. It's a great point you're making about that's the after word trying to figure out, but it's the gaps in language and the stories and the mystery that brings it back to what I see in a nonprofit I am working in now as co-founder, this whole different way of school for the future, for a future that is very much um, youth led. And, and Jason, your mapping of the different sciences recently that I learned the four uh, ways we can do or in, think of science was really helpful. I see it as a circularity there where we're returning to, let's say, science one, which I connect to a more indigenous way, which was also present in the language and culture backgrounds of the students I was working with. So um, thank you um, for all the presentations today. Uh, Lewis, I'd love to see that article too about math because um, we learn, kids learn a whole lot more than math in math class. <laughs> Just even the fact that they're in rows, their seats. So I love, I love um, the discussion. It's very practical for me. So yeah, also, also, uh, Jamie, uh, Jamie's uh, triangle thing actually is the extension of uh, Karl Popper's three word, uh, three word hypothesis. Uh, Jamie herself, with a little chicken in her head, uh, is the word two, and uh, the real chicken picture there is the uh, word one, and uh, that language thing spelling C H I C K. Uh, that is so-called the word uh, three. Okay, <laughs> so 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 it's a good uh, uh, application. Uh, yeah, uh, one sorry. more one more point for Gerard. Um, I it's, some of the work I do is facilitating courses uh, with Fritjof Capra, who does a really great job of uh, building a sense of deep time 
a, like an evolutionary sense of a very long time of development. And But one point that really sticks with me um, is when he talks about Australopithecus, suddenly we're on two feet, which means our hands are freed up for grasping tools. Um, and at this point in history, people decide they are better off living in social social um, relationships and, and language pops. So I'm constantly curious about language as the original technology. And I'm especially interested in um, helping children design good prompts as AI is here, because we are no longer in that deep time space. Things are fast. Yeah. If I may very quickly uh, comment here, this, uh, the, the reason I ended with the six triangles is to make the very sharp distinction between the graphic symbol and the spoken symbol. And that when I read a lot of books on deep history, they totally ignore the emergence of the graphic symbol. I mean, it's just shocking how many bestsellers there are that talk about language without ever uh, differentiating between the two. So um, so this I, I, I don't know how the conversation with Capra evolves, but when you say technology, I'm thinking of a finger drawing a line or a scratch on a rock, and yeah. then only afterwards is a spoken language possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, he has, he has the paintings at Lescaux. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I'm looking for a rock I can show you from my garden that was actually a token for the hunt for the Menominee people that lived here. So after the ice age, there are artifacts. Yeah. And then just one more thing, Jason, I think this is so interesting about, because some of us are involved in an archiving project for um, the American Society for Cybernetics. So how we tell the story is as important as the stories that we're collecting, I think. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Bill Roth, you have a question? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jamie. Um, I really appreciate it, um, what you have been doing. Uh, there is a relatively small issue which I wonder about. Uh, that was the use of, sorry, uh, the black box. Is the black box, do you use the black box as a tool uh, to embrace, collect uh, what it is you want to talk about in daily life? Or is it part of a research process where you intend to identify knowledge about what is in or what is covered by uh, the black box? Uh, 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 thank you for that question, Gerard, uh, because that helps me uh, also respond to something I lucid earlier. So. You were wondering why no one responded to, I'm right, you're wrong, and etc. So when I was reading Glamville, I have to say, my first thing was, he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the reason I said that was because he said the black box stands either for the unknown or the unknowable. And I thought, how can you know that it stands for the unknowable? Because that is, you draw a line to, so in order to say it's unknowable, you need to know where the dis difference is between the two. And um, so then I, I started uh, a whole bunch of things clicked together because uh, Glanville, I kept on reading and I found an article where he comments on your work and the conferences that you all did on problem solving. Apparently, you, you organized a lot of conferences to, to really focus on this uh, process of problem solving. And then I remembered some comments you made on Karl Popper's work so that you had been familiar with it. And now Karl Popper makes also references to cybernetics. So, so there was all this clicking in my head. But Lou, it started by me being resistant <laughs> and by saying, I'm going to disagree. And, and the resistance that actually suddenly made things fall in places. So I see the black box now as, a, as an all-purpose tool to do any of the above. Mm -hmm. And 
Lisa, what you brought up, if you look at all the cultures all over the world, they're full of stories of black boxes that are supposed to remain closed and then people open it and all sorts of things happen. So the black box can, it can be used for anything like anxiety, mystery, curiosity, um, yeah, playfulness. No. So all purpose, all purpose tool. Yeah. Uh. I can make yeah. another comment about Black Box that you might enjoy. Think of Spencer Brown's original setup where you have a circle for a distinction and the inside is unmarked. It's important that it's not marked. That means yeah. it has no no, no textual symbol, no symbol, nothing. Yeah. Um, or it means that you don't know what's inside. So the unmarked becomes the unobserved. Yeah. And and the original distinction takes the form of a black box. Yes. And I think that was what Glanville was doing because he wrote like three. I mean, that he was playing with this idea no, and trying to put to it in yes. words. And it took him several papers and and a few more, maybe. <laughs> Okay, finish about the black box. <laughs> uh, I tell you a secret, Jason and Hu. Uh, when I was in about uh, between uh, as a child, very young child, like a three to five or even to ten, I had a nickname of a uh, uh, black box smasher. <laughs> uh, I collected all kinds of uh, fancy toys. Uh, some have a magic uh, for moving by themselves, and I will definitely dissemble every one of them to figure out how how it works. So, so that is the very very early memory about curiosity of something I cannot understand, and by dissemble it. And uh, later in my teenage could, years, could you reassemble it? That's in the teenager years. I started assembling radios. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. so I go to yeah. I go to the trash pile of uh, a, a factory and to collect uh, the, 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 the diodes, transistors, and all kinds of parts. And, and then putting them together according to theory. So, so that was the very early age I get encountered with Maxwell's equation, uh, how radio works. So, so after you smashing, what I want to say here is after your effort of smashing a black box and find out more about inside and all, I think our task or more interesting thing is how do we start building them? And this time, if they are built by us, it's not a black box anymore. It's magic box. Like your mobile phone, like your laptop computer, those are all magic boxes built by the engineer. But for, for, the, for the people who cannot understand what's going on inside your mobile phone, inside your computer, they are still black boxes. So the whole process is to uh, move further, okay, to the construction side. Uh, and your living itself is an oscillation between yourself as a black box and yourself as a being that you know. <laughs>